Hi guys, welcome to a video. And in today's video, the topic is the commodification and distortion of the lesbian identity. It's interesting to look at the ways that the lesbian identity has been distorted, packaged and sold off in a multitude of ways and how the representation of lesbianism in the media and what is consumed by wider society is quite different from the reality of lesbianism itself. Because a lot of this media has not been created or had any kind of input from actual gay women, this has caused a distorted perception of lesbianism which has had a damaging effect on the lesbian community in their day-to-day -day lives. Just as a content warning for this video, I will be talking about things such as misogyny and homophobia. There may be content in this video which is unsettling for queer or lesbian women. I'm gonna be talking about the adult film industry, violence against gay women, hypersexualization of lesbianism. It's nothing too graphic, of course, but if you're not having the best mental health day, please go and watch kittens instead. This is an educational video. I feel like this subject really needs to be talked about. It's not talked about enough in the community, which I get we don't really wanna focus on the kind of more negative aspects of what it is to be a lesbian in the world, but I gotta make the video. There will also be a bunch of sources in the description if people want to research further into this topic or just want some statistics to look at and so on and so forth. So let's just get right to it. I'm gonna start with the adult film industry. The adult film industry has millions upon millions of consumers. It is an industry which largely targets men. The content in this industry is also very much largely produced and created by men, specifically for a male audience. There are of course exceptions here and there, but on the whole, this is what the industry is. And I'm not here to debate the ethics of consuming, adult film, I just want to look at its correlation to the lesbian identity. So what is one of the most popular categories in the adult film industry? It is of course lesbians. Actually according to surveys it's the number one most searched category by women who consume adult film. However women barely make up a quarter of adult film consumers overall so you do have to take that into consideration. The way in which some straight women and even some, not all, but some queer women perceive and treat lesbianism as a sexual fetish is worth mentioning here. Some of these women can be guilty of reducing lesbianism to a solely sexual entity or curiosity in which lesbians and other queer women exist to be used to gratify them and in some cases their male partners or wielding lesbianism in a way which connects to male gratification. This is a whole other subject which I won't go into in too much detail but this behaviour is also very dehumanising and is of course worth mentioning in relation to the hypersexualization of the lesbian identity. So a lot of the lesbians in the adult film industry aren't lesbians at all, of course. In fact, it's often two heterosexual women who are being paid to do certain acts in front of a camera, which is appealing to a male audience. The production itself often focuses on certain acts that are reminiscent of heterosexual engagement. The women who are performing these acts are often presented in a singular way that has a heteronormative appeal. For example, you know, feminine presenting, long hair, high heels, little to no body hair and long nails. Of course, the way in which a woman presents herself has no correlation to her sexuality. However, the majority of the women you see in these types of productions are of a singular type and are performing femininity. But what this suggests is that lesbianism is digestible and consumer friendly as long as these women look a certain way and are performing 
femininity and we need to keep this in mind for later on in the video. So obviously the majority of people can separate the fantasy aspects of the adult film industry from real life, but regardless, the industry is most people's introduction to lesbianism and in some cases maybe their only engagement with it. And it is one of hypersexualization and male gratification. This coupled with the fact that there is little to no real education surrounding sex or sexuality in schools and minimal exposure to other forms of healthy lesbian or gay representation in which to offset this hypersexualization of lesbians is what distorts the public perception of lesbianism and even women so much. So what do people who consume lesbian adult film take away from its existence and the performances that they're seeing? Well, oftentimes they'll take away from it that lesbianism in itself is a performance for other people's gratification. And in fact, lesbians themselves become a pornography category. But only when lesbians look like the women in these adult videos. Which is what I was referring to about the feminine performance aspect of the adult film industry and the singular type of woman they tend to present. So what happens when you have two moderately to high feminine women who are lesbians out in the public sphere? The truth is, being visibly in a relationship with another woman in the public sphere can and does lead to harassment. And we see this not only in statistics, but I also know this from first-hand experience. I know in part this is due to male entitlement and objectification of women, but it's also in part due to the hypersexualization of the lesbian identity. Heterosexual couples are scarcely confronted with this attitude in the public sphere, if at all. Of course, most people can distinguish reality from fantasy, which is essentially what the adult film industry um, is. But the adult film industry certainly fuels this idea that lesbianism is a performance for other people's gratification, specifically male gratification. Meanwhile, lesbians who walk around in the public sphere and take on a more masculine appearance and aren't as appealing to men are met with hostility. And these women often face abuse in the public sphere for not adhering to female gender conventions and for not performing femininity. So this lesbianism serves me attitude is by and large why female homosexuality has been given more of a pass historically in society as opposed to male homosexuality. This gratification aspect and the infantilization of women is attached to this notion that, you know, women are taken less seriously in society, so therefore women want to be with other women, that is also taken less seriously, as opposed to two men wanting to be together, where men are taken extra seriously. So when you have two men together, that's a extra serious issue. These attitudes are reflected in the legal system, either historically in some countries and currently in others, where punishments are much more severe for gay men than they are for gay women, and where attitudes towards gay men are twice as hostile than they are towards gay women. To add to this, some people will think it's fine to consume lesbian adult film for sexual gratification, but they'll also practice homophobia in the public sphere, or they'll hold homophobic beliefs. Again, reducing lesbianism to being acceptable as long as it's only for sexual gratification, but lesbianism in its full reality of women loving other women is regarded with hostility. This is something I've encountered myself both in the public sphere but also on this channel. You know, this channel's, you know, oh my god, it's nearly 10 years old or it is 10 years old and the amount of times, you know, I've had men coming here because I create lesbian film and then them kind of lashing out when the type of lesbian film I create is not what they're used to or not for their gratification, I quite often get men coming here to lash out. Throughout history, lesbians have struggled to be visible 
because women have struggled to be visible. All of our ideas about lesbianism and women have been distorted because throughout history there has been a distinct lack of lesbians and women speaking on their own behalf. This has created a hostile society for lesbians to reside in because for a long time wider society projected this pervert forward slash fetish narrative onto us and we had no platform with which to safely combat these prejudices. But we'll keep this kind of lack of authentic voice in lesbian representation, we'll keep that in mind for later on in the video. The lesbian identity is polemic to patriarchal and heteronormative notions, however lesbians are forced to live in societies which prioritise these structures and ideals, often shaping our lives negatively. So often the way we think about women and their sexuality is through a male lens, it's through a patriarchal lens and it's through a heteronormative lens. And still to this day, even I have to unpack misogynistic and homophobic notions that have been instilled in me growing up in this society. And I know when I released my first poetry book, Dirty Pony, I had some criticism from other lesbians that by my expressing my own sexuality, it was somehow for male gratification and objectification. But of course it's not, it's just that as women, we we're supposed to be kind of desexualized, and if you do show any sign of kind of sexuality, it's attributed to a kind of heteronormative male sphere, if you like. And therefore the adult film industry has become kind of entrenched in our identity, because that's most people's introduction to lesbianism, including my own, when I was very, very young you know? So moving away from the fantasy aspect and the adult film industry, running alongside this hypersexualization of lesbianisms, we also have this sobering reality where even to this day, you know, homosexual women can lose their jobs because of their sexuality. And, you know, in some countries, it might even cost you your life. Lesbians also have a history of being hounded by the police for not dressing a certain way and having their spaces raided. You know, lesbians were deemed perverts. They're not trustworthy to be around children. Lesbians needed to go to conversion therapy and be saved. And who are the people who are fighting for the liberation of gay women and for social change. You know, by and large, it's been LGBT people fighting for LGBT rights. And it's been activists who have been fighting for social change and for liberation. It's not the people who create adult film, it's not the male or heterosexual creators who cash in on the lesbian identity whilst excluding lesbian voice. You know, these creators are often very happy to have a lucrative income due to growing mainstream LGBT acceptance in society. And this brings me very nicely into the realm of books and television and film. And here we see a different kind of distortion and commodification which is happening around lesbianism. So gay and lesbian literature has a history of censorship in the West. And of course in a lot of countries around the world there's an ongoing censorship of lesbian literature. And we often see societal attitudes towards lesbianism mirrored in this literature that is produced. Really before the late 20th century, producing lesbian literature in the West was a very risky move. You know, it could cost you your, your job and your social standing if you had been discovered to have been producing these works. But even still, lesbian and queer women risked all of that in creating content which would provide an authentic narrative and offer an authentic source of representation for other gay women, which was a respite from these notions of hypersexualization and the moral ill that was and is associated with lesbianism. And the same goes for film. You know, historically, lesbian and queer filmmakers have really struggled to secure the finances to create these works and to see their visions realised and give the community some kind of representation outside of trauma or hypersexualization. And I just want to add here that black 
Indigenous women of colour filmmakers have had to work three times as hard as that to get any kind of representation. To people who often feel much more isolated in not only their own communities but also the LGBT community as well. Filmmakers like Cheryl Dunier, Alice Wu and Donna Deitch really lay down a lot of the groundwork in lesbian film and also to just let lesbians have a presence in film without some kind of damaging trope being attached to it. So fast forward to now, you know, after years and years of LGBT activism and fighting for visibility, lesbian film has now kind of blossomed and become almost a lucrative entity, not necessarily recognised by the Academy Awards, um, but that's for another video. And as a result of this, you now get a lot of heterosexual and male filmmakers cashing in on this. You know, even trying to profit from it under the guise of, you know, artistic intent. When in reality, a lot of these pieces often just pull lesbians back into damaging tropes or try and bring it right back around to that kind of male gratification aspect, which is associated with lesbianism on screen. I'm gonna catch fire for saying this, I know, but even something like Imagine Me and You has a very strong presence of male sexuality running through the film. I know, I know, but it's true. And in a lot of ways, this heterosexual or man-made lesbian film, which excludes lesbian voice and input, is no different from the adult film industry. It's made to appeal to a male audience and definitely comes with a level of distortion. I mean, in some cases, such as Blue is the Warmest Colour, we can definitely see it's straight up mimics lesbianism in the adult film industry without apology and therefore just brings it back to this place of heteronormativity. Now, of course, this doesn't always in every single case devalue the entertainment factor of these films and the motives behind making these kinds of films aren't always from an inherently negative place. But at the same time, it will always, without exception, be a distortion of lesbianism. Now, I know we live in a capitalist society and where people see a way to make money they will do it. Regardless of the ethics, regardless of the implications or impact that something would have on a community, that's just the reality of the world that we live in. But art doesn't exist in an isolated vacuum, it doesn't exist in an isolated sphere, it's not a tiny island that's not connected to anything else. Art is very much connected to finance and therefore it's connected to power. So when we put our money into these productions, all we are doing is keeping these damaging distortions in circulation and lending them power, and at the same time, lining the pockets of creators who are often already in a place of financial and social privilege as it is. And art also shapes the way that we think about other people and think about our society and the world that we live in. It's a very powerful thing. And we know, we know from wider history what happens when a minority loses their voice or other people start to talk for this minority. The reality is, is when the perception of a minority group gets distorted and when other people are speaking for this minority group, people will start to project this distorted image that they've been fed onto those people in real life. And this is very dangerous, this has real life consequences, ranging from smaller microaggressions to large scale violence. And that's why having this conversation is so, so important. A lot of the times when I criticise lesbian media that hasn't been created by queer or lesbian women, or had any kind of lesbian input or involvement Involvement. The conversation of divisiveness comes up, you know, I get accused of being divisive. Let me remind you that women and gay people in general did not set the dividers in society. They were set for us. In fact, those dividers are still in place to this day and they have caused untold damage 
on women and untold damage on the LGBT community at large. We're not living in a post-homophobic and post-misogynistic world. We're really not. So calling commodification and highlighting the distortion of lesbianism is not the same thing as dehumanising people and forcing them to live under oppressive structures which make their lives very difficult to live. However, there is some good news. We are now living in a time where marginalised people who were previously unheard of and who previously didn't have a voice can now begin to speak for themselves and speak of their own lived experiences. Thanks to the digital realm, groups of people who were once silenced and didn't have a voice now do. And we can have these kinds of conversations which once would have been denied a platform and would have been subject to censorship. And this ties into a larger change taking place in the way that lesbianism is perceived and hopefully this will bleed into how gay women are treated in the public sphere. Hopefully making society a much nicer place for women and for gay women to exist in. Well, that was a kick. It was. Okay guys, thanks for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. I'd especially like to hear from other gay and queer women and I'll see you soon. Bye.